we have Brother Kaba with us today, and we're going to talk about everything that's going on in uh, the world. Basically, uh, I want to start off by saying rest in peace to Mike Jr., Mike Brown Jr., and a uh, victim of police brutality. He was uh, gunned down, as you know, by a police officer in Ferguson, uh, Missouri. And I want to start off by talking about that and, you know, get your feelings on what you feel about the Mike Brown Jr. situation. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, my feelings is to, to step back and see the entire, uh, the, the, the entire event. And as a people of color, we, you know, we have to see that this, this event, as sad as it is, and I send my regards to family, has been a historic event in our lives since we came to these shows, post 1492. And I think that what we have to do as a people is understand who we're dealing with. We're, we're dealing with a wolf, and we have to understand the nature of the wolf. If, I, if I'm in my house and I look out my window and I see a wolf outside my door, I am gonna go out, hopefully, prepared for the wolf. If I come out unprepared for the wolf, the wolf bite me, I can't complain because I knew it was a wolf when I looked out the window. Hmm. We, we are dealing with predators who survive going after prey. And when we get to the point, and I'm speaking of a people of African American descent, when we get to a point where we understand who we are and we understand who they are, then we will be able to deal with them. My mama used to always say, you know, if you're going to deal with your enemy, you have to understand your enemy. You can't think like yourself when you're trying to solve your problems. You gotta think like your enemy. And we're dealing in a civilization where the African American community, whether we speak Spanish or French or Dutch, we are preyed upon. And they have made a living off of preying upon us. Hmm. Whether it is in the incarceration centers or whether it is in our schools. When we were liberated, there was no place for us in this society. We were here, we were brought here specifically to be enslaved and to do work for free. They never thought the day would come that we would not be in that condition. When we became so-called emancipated, there was no place for us in the society. And so they had to find a way to use us in order to make economic gain. And the two ways in which they make money is either through the schools or through the incarceration centers. And now it's becoming to the point where they are creating little tunnels between the schools and the prisons. And so this is why there is an attempt to take over the schools, uh, specifically as it relates to the charter schools and the incarceration centers. They're privatizing them. And so that when you have a company that owns a prison and you have the same company own a school, it's just a matter of when they graduate, they graduate into prison. I've often called the New York City Probably. Board of Education, I called it Rikers Prep. Wow. Because the educational institutions turning off our children from understanding who they are, are creating groups of people that will one day be in the prisons. The sad story is it ain't gonna work. And we'll see it unfold in time. So my thing is, even if it doesn't work, and even if what we call white supremacy no longer exists, my question is, are we ready to have our own political system, our own economic system, our own educational system, our own entertainment system? Are we ready to take this over? I don't think so. We have to be thinking about a time when we are not in this condition, because it's coming. And I know that we all believe that what we're experiencing and seeing is going to go last for a long time, but it's not. White supremacy is dead. The only thing keeping it alive is the fact that we think it's still around. The oppressor, only weapon against the oppressed is the mind of the oppressed. And what we have to start to do is we have to start thinking of the day when we will no longer be oppressed. What do you feel about the rioting that's going on in Ferguson? Ain't no rioting, man. That's rebellion, brother. Rebellion. <laughs> uh, hey, listen, I'm not going to tell them to stop, but I certainly hope that they gear it towards the right way. You know, there's a, a gospel song that says, keep your lamp lit but trimmed. Mm -hmm. I keep really your lamp lit, lit but, but trimmed. trimmed. You know, keep what? it under control. Be a thinker now. 
Okay, if you live in that apartment house and you don't have any place to live, don't burn that house down. Good way you go to sleep. Right. Okay, maybe it doesn't belong to you. But have we put a plan in maybe one day we'll buy it? There has to be a plan. There has to be a plan. See, the Montgomery bus boycott was very successful, but it was the greatest failure that we ever had. And why was that? Because plan? I would hope that after 300 and something days of us not getting on that bus, I would have hoped that some black folk were building a bus company for themselves. We were just fighting so that we would make them let us sit in the front of their bus. I wish we could have walked away from their entire bus company and didn't care what they did. That's what we should have done. As we're dealing with these issues today, we need to move away from any concept as, as it relates to what's happening in Ferguson, Missouri. Right. They are expressing themselves. They are angry. My, my mama used to call it righteous indignation. They've had enough. The Black Panther Party was born out of that. Out of violence, out of police The police brutality. brutality. Right. To be a policeman is a sacred obligation. Right. You carry something that, that is called life and death on your side. Right. It's not all of them. It's not all kinds. No, it's not. No, I, right. I have, in fact, sometimes in my life I've been very happy to see a policeman right. for the situation I was in. <laughs> So, so I don't play like that, you right, know, and right. that, that's what thinkers do. Thinkers know the difference. See, you know, in Kemet, you, you, you have this impu, which is a dog. He is the discriminator. Okay. And the image of the discriminator is to be able to tell the difference between something that can be saved and something that cannot be saved. The dog has that discrimination to know when something can be eaten and when it has become poisonous. The dog can. Yeah. The dog. Because yeah, I've heard that dogs won't even drink certain water. That's right. They'll they'll turn away from it. Yes. If it's, if it's poisonous or absolutely it has, yeah, too much chlorine or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And it's the power of the smell that allows them to discriminate that. We must. And this is why our ancestors took animals and demonstrated putting them on human bodies because they said, "I would like to have the discriminatory power mm. of a dog." So that's what the the, the, the ibis bird was. The, yes. For to. The, the ibis bird was a smart bird. That was right. the knowledge bird. So they said, I'd like the knowledge of a of a smart bird. And in that beak they have, it has a snake inside of the beak at times. Like I've yes. seen images where they're, they're like with the beak, the, the snake is hanging from the beak. And the snake, of course, represents right. resurrection, spiritual resurrection. Spiritual resurrection. So in other words, you're ingesting your spiritual manifestations. Wow. For you, for you, for eternity. All of our ancestors, as they did this, they they took heads of animals and put them on human bodies, hoping to be able to get that. So they had a cat on the head of a human body, in order to show the agility of a cat. See, because a cat has nine lives, so a cat represented earthly resurrection. A snake represented through molting, shedding skin, spiritual resurrection. And so we need to have impulse power, the discriminatory power. To, to understand how you can walk up to authority that is acting inappropriately and be able to conduct yourself in a way that you make them go down off of where they are. But at the same time, you don't go that far where they pull a gun out and shoot you. We need that discriminatory power. So what should a parent t teach a child or any teenager about protecting themselves or, or being able to steer away from certain situations like that in, in the community? Be aware of your environment. Teach them critical thinking skills to be able to understand that there are times that you're dealing with a human being who has the ability to make it so that you don't come home tonight. And I don't want to get that call. Yes, sir. No, sir. Move away. Sometimes people can't handle it. I don't have a problem saying yes, sir, no, sir, because I have a wife and three children I got to come home to and a grandson. And I know that's a wolf. And like all wolves, their nature is to be a predator. They have no conscience. So if you're going to get all, all, all up in the wolf's face and you ain't got nothing that's going to protect you, they're they going to gobble you up. Right. You can't complain when a wolf gobbles you because you knew the nature of the wolf when he came on you. Right. That's what we have to teach our children, to understand, be a critical thinker, Un understand how to manage your life. And give us a breakdown of what critical thinking is for people that understand when you say critical thinking. When, when a policeman comes up to you for no reason at all and he's all up in your face or she, you have to understand that that's a predator. And they're just waiting for you to do something, to, get, uh, to, to be able to do something to you, which includes taking your life. And if you address them in a certain way and they're still coming at you, you have to understand they're baiting you to do something so they can kill you. 
And so you have to conduct yourself in a way that you, you draw. Like, for instance, one thing is that yes, sir, no, sir. Uh, you, you have to know your rights. You have to understand how to conduct yourself in the street. At a time of that emotional, that is no time to try to prove your manhood or your womanhood by getting up in that policeman's face. You may be angry, you may be upset, but the bottom line is they can kill you and they will kill you. And the way they're interacting with you, they want to kill you. So you are immediately creating a situation where in a sense you're creating, so you are, you are performing suicide on yourself because you know what they want to do. It's unfortunate to have to tell our children this, my brother. I don't want to tell our children this, but there's a reality. I want you to come home tonight, man. <laughs> I want to see right. you tonight, man. I love you. I want to see you tonight. Yeah. And when you're out there with the wolf, you're going to understand. Right. It's possible you're not coming home tonight simply because you may have backtalked, simply because you may have brushed up against them, right. simply they may have brushed up against you in the hope that you, you would brush up against them so they could pull their gun out and shoot you. Right. Because there are people who live off of the fact because wolves are only dangerous when they travel in packs. A wolf ain't gonna jump you when you're alone. They have brave, they're very brave when they're in packs. Right. And, it, and if you look at Eric Garner in New York City, Staten Island, you will see five grown men bringing that one man down. If you look at any of the other cases, you will see multiple people bringing folk down. And if anybody wants to understand what a gun is to European people, I encourage you to read the essay in the ISIS papers by Dr. Francis Cress Welsing when she breaks down the psychology of the gun and what it means to them. That is their manhood. That's why it's shaped like a, a gun. And that's why when you pull the trigger, mm -hmm. it shoots. Bullets. Bullets. But instead of the sperm that creates life, it takes it. It takes it. My first message to black folk, stay out of prison the best you can. Those that are caught and brought there, but for those of us who may be acting inappropriately, stay out of prison. Because the 13th Amendment will tell you slavery never was abolished. It was sidestepped into prison. It says it right in the 13th Amendment. It, it, you know, I mean, if you read the 13th Amendment, it says that, that forced servitude and slavery is abolished, comma, except when you've been found guilty of a crime by a jury of your peers. Wow. That comma and that contrasting conjunction except means that everything I just said means nothing because that exists where I'm about to tell you right now. That's, that's linguistic, that's language arts. Slavery still exists in America, it exists in prison. Prisons are the new plantations. I tell black folk, stay out of prison. Stay out. Stay out of prison. Or be smart enough not, because you know there's a difference, you know, between a you know a smart criminal and a stupid criminal. You know, a stupid criminal gets caught. <laughs> My message to our people is to come one with your African roots, come one with your spirituality, love yourself, respect yourself, because it's only when you love yourself and respect yourself that you can love someone else and respect someone else. And that it becomes very important that as we move through this process, you understand you got to have a Marcus Garvey mentality. And that Marcus Mosiah Garvey mentality says, it ain't over till we win. We shall overcome by any means necessary. When you know your history, you realize you are a mighty people who will accomplish what you will. Because Bob Marley said, no one can curse who Jah has blessed. And the fact that we here, being able to do this, Jah has blessed us. We have work to do. And after we get back to where we need to get, we have to remember our great brother and ancestor, Mayor Chokwe Lumumba of Jackson, Mississippi, who said, when all is said and done, we will come right with the Creator when we save the land. Save the land. To save the water, save the earth, save the air, save the fire. Save our children, save the future. Because I honestly believe that the Creator has put in our hands, since we know heaven and since we know hell, He, she, has put in our hands the ability to move this world where it needs to be. Because we have both worlds. We understand what it is like. And yet with true love and respect and honor, with malice to no one, with no vengeance, 
towards people. To not fight under persecution. We will be able to do whatever it is that we will. And this is what we have to keep in mind. It ain't over till we win. That's Marcus Garvey's mentality. That brother died in 1940 in London with a pen in his hand planning how to build a black bank for the world. That's a powerful thought. With everything they did to him, he died with the pen in his hand ready to build a black bank. Never give up. This ain't over till we win. Good, brother. That was real good.